Okay, uh, my talk is very short compared to the other speakers. Uh, although it's in practical terms, it's the most difficult, one of the more difficult aspects when you look after a patient with dementia. BPSD, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. First, uh, as with any psychiatric conditions, behavioral problems, we always try to, to treat the the symptoms from a behavioral point of view. We try to avoid medications because of the problems with side effects. So we use non-pharmacological therapies. Uh, this should always be the first to be tried. And often the family members would have tried different types of behavioral measures on their own. Evidence is varied. Some show the patient with dementia do sort of respond or temporary short-term benefits. Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, very subjective because the family may feel that it's beneficial when actually in objective measures it's more the reassurance to the family members. But as I mentioned, they always should be considered first line uh, because as with medication, there's a risk of side effects, drug interactions with other medications and also with uh, these uh, psychiatric medication, they do affect sometimes and mask uh, the behavior and uh, other medical problems that the patient may have. Categories of non-pharmacological therapies. Uh, medical and nursing care, this would be in an inpatient institutional setting. Uh, when a patient is admitted, we want to exclude some medical causes and reversible medical conditions. Among the more common uh, triggers of agitation and behavioral disturbances are actually constipation, urinary tract infection, or even symptom, uh, some URTI. So we want to make sure that there's uh, any pain is relieved and... Uh, uh, enhance of enhancement of the day-to-day -day care through uh, through reassurance, distraction, and uh, training of the family members. Yeah, the environment should be designed to be safe. So, in a lot of nursing home settings, you have you have uh, pathways for patients to walk about. Some of our patients, I mean, there are various types of BPSDs from uh, verbal agitation to physical agitation. Uh, many of them actually can be quite ambulant in the early stages and uh, physically they can be quite well so they can be quite ambulant. Uh, having a, a place for them to expand their energy is useful so you have these wandering paths especially when it's uh, closer to nature. For activities, most of the nursing homes that are well run would have occupational therapists and physiotherapists to provide some diversional therapy for them. Ideally one-to-one -one interaction but in a situation like Singapore where many family members are at work or studying or, or even in the hospital setting, the staff to patient ratio is limited. One-to-one -one interaction is often insufficient and uh, so you, you use as many other measures as possible. Stimulation is a term that was coined sometime in 1997 by some author describing a uh, multi-sensory stimulation uh, using uh, the various uh, senses, stimulating the various senses. So you have your tactile, auditory, visual, and uh, olfactory stimulations in, in special sort of rooms. They call them New Zealand rooms, which are darkened rooms with bright lights and aromatherapy. And some of the nursing homes have a special room designed for patients who may be restless or agitated, but they tend to be very limited because it's usually one small room in the whole nursing home and not many patients have been sent in together at the same time. So, but there have been some evidence that it's helpful for BPSD. Uh, psychological therapies like behavioral therapy, uh, reminiscence therapy also can be useful. Uh, art therapy, bright light therapy. Bright light therapy is sometimes used for, for the, uh, the sun downing, the circadian rhythm where the patient gets more agitated towards the evening. Sometimes you use bright light therapy at certain times of the day. It seems to help to reduce the agitation, the sun downing in some of the patients. Staff training, of course, are uh, very important because they need to know about the condition of, of how to uh, manage some of these patients from a behavioral, behavioral point of view. Now for the pharmacological management. Antidepressants. Antidepressants may be used for the treatment of comorbid depression in dementia, provided their use has been evaluated carefully for each patient. So it's individualized treatment. Uh, the antidepressants do have an effect in patients with dementia when they have depression, but it tends to be, the efficacy is not as good as, say, in the younger adult. All the studies that you get for, say, the SSRIs, the tricyclics, with that two-thirds improvement in 
in symptoms applies to general adults, not really to the elderly. Elderly patients tend to respond more poorly. They tend to be more treatment refractory. Uh, yeah. SSRIs do not appear effective in the treatment of the behavioral symptoms of dementia other than depression. But there have been, there were some old studies to show that uh, some of the SSRIs even for patients without depression, the agitation seems to improve, maybe because of an anti-anxiety effect. But in general, they are not, most, most of the new evidence says it's not very useful. Uh, there's no current evidence available on the new antidepressants in the treatment in dementia. That's basically what I said. The antipsychotics, these are usually used for patients who are agitated or very disturbed or aggressive or frankly uh, psychotic with hallucinations or delusions. So they, they both use conventional and, atyp and the atypical uh, new generation antipsychotics may be used with caution, but you have to be mindful of their side effect profile. The conventional antipsychotics like haloperidol, chlorpromazine, they have a higher risk of extrapyramidal side effects. The new ones tend to have lower risk of those uh, extra pyramidal side effects. Uh, so you have to balance that with uh, the benefits that it can provide. There is evidence for benefit for haloperidol over placebo in the treatment of aggression. Chlorpromazine can be used with caution, but you have to be careful about hypotension and, and anticholinergic side effects, which can aggravate, say, prosthetism or constipation. The atypical antipsychotics, the main ones that are used in psychogeriatrics are Olanzapine, Risperdal, Risperidone, and uh, Seroquel, Quetiapine, uh, and they do show if efficacy in agitated symptoms, patients with agitation, and can be quite useful. Uh, they do improve their agitation scores, but uh, uh, with all of these medications, you should always aim for the lowest dose and titrate accordingly to the symptoms. Side effects: they do cause somnolence drowsiness, they cause gait disturbance, so they may be more unsteady and more prone to falls. Uh, there have also been reported increased risk of deaths through cerebrovascular events. Strokes and TIAs are reportedly more common with uh, the atypical antipsychotics, and there's an increased risk of mortality, morbidity, sudden mortality. Okay, Aripiprazole is also beginning to be used more often nowadays, and there is uh, associated with a risk of death. So it seems to be a class effect where with all these newer anti antipsychotics, they seem to have an increased risk. Well, there's a bit of an incongruent thing. No statistical increase in mortality, and uh, yeah, there seems to be an increased risk of yeah. And other side effects would include weight gain, especially with olanzapine. Comparison between typical and atypical antipsychotics, you can't, uh, there's no evidence to show that one group is superior to the other. It's mainly the side effect profile that you have to be careful with. Increased mortality among, okay, the, uh, another new study, it's shown even with the conventional antipsychotics, there is also an increased mortality. There's no advantage to choose the newer antipsychotics over the older antipsychotics according to the guidelines that we are publishing. Trazodone, Trazodone is, a, is an antidepressant with serotonin uh, effects, serotonergic effects. It's got very, it's a very sedating antidepressant. It's sim something like a tricyclic except it doesn't have uh, the effects on the cardiovascular system. So uh, they can also cause as a side effect postural hypotension. But it's quite useful for patients who are unable to sleep with insomnia and patients who are agitated. Mood stabilizers. It used to be that carbamazepine and sodium valproate were, were frequently used for patients with agitation because of the fear of using the antipsychotics with uh, with their side effects. So in the past, we used to often use more Tegretol and Epilim to control behavioral disturbances, but uh, apparently it's not as useful nowadays uh, with the latest information. And uh, there's no improvement in behavioral symptoms with mood stabilizers. Benzodiazepines, there's no published evidence of its usefulness. Again, published evidence mainly Perhaps because uh, no one's willing to pay for these, uh, these trials because most of these benzodiazepines are, are off patent. So, but from practical points of view, practical point of view, uh, benzodiazepines are often useful for insomnia and, and anxiety related to BPSD. Okay, treatment considerations. An individual approach to managing behavioral problems in dementia is required. In view of the potential adverse effects with antipsychotic therapy, so we aim for non-pharmacological interventions first, identifying any reversible causes 
that may be aggravating their symptoms. If uh, behavioral measures fail to work, then we go on to the next line, which is medication. Uh, first line would be the antipsychotic therapy, but we have to be careful of the side effects and have to discuss the risks versus benefits with the family members. For behavioral and psychological symptoms of, of dementia, cholinesterase inhibitors have also been found to be useful if uh, antipsychotics are contraindicated. But uh, again, the cost versus benefits will be, have to be measured. Like, it tends to be very costly to use cholinesterase inhibitors for treatment of behavioral symptoms and the symptom improvement may be very marginal. Okay, for Lewy body dementia and behavioral problems, well, patients with Lewy body dementia, anti uh, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors should be the first treatment of choice because uh, if you use antipsychotics, their, their symptoms, their Parkinsonian symptoms often get worse and they become more, more disabled. There's evidence that river stigmine is useful in Lewy body patients. So we avoid antipsychotic medication in patients who have Lewy body dementia. The risk of life-threatening neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a possibility. If you see a patient with dementia and behavioral problems, uh, we have to screen and evaluate for any reversible causes of delirium, pain and other medical and environmental causes, say like uh, new something new happening in the family. So we have to sort of screen and go through the history of the family members, whether there are any changes that can be done environmentally. And the behavioral analysis, A, B, C. So what is the behavior, what is the trigger, the antecedent, and what is the consequence of the behavior? For example, what is the reaction of the family to this agitated behavior? Sometimes the reaction of the family members, the consequence of the behavior can drive the behavior uh, and perpetuated. Uh, so you start as the next line of treatment, you start the non-pharmacological management aimed directly at the behavior and if that doesn't work, if it works, well you just monitor. If it doesn't work, you go down the line, you screen for anxiety and depression, you treat with antidepressant SSRI for the anxiety or depression. If that is not the main symptom, then you consider whether you want to start cholinesterase inhibitors with or without mementin. And uh, if the patient improves, well and good, but if it doesn't, then you want to consider antipsychotic medication. Sometimes we skip this if we feel that the cost to the patient or to the family is too high, the cholinesterase is better, the, the financial cost. So you go straight to antipsychotic medication. So you can either choose the conventional or the atypical antipsychotic medication. So if the behavior as, uh, doesn't show improvement, you try a trial of SSRI. And uh, if it doesn't, then you try your third line mood stabilizers. And if it doesn't, then you consider referring to a specialist where the patient will probably require to be hospitalized and treated in an institutional setting.